started. Um, thanks for being here today and uh, welcome to the closing conference of our 2023 lecture series, Intel Connections. So today we're hosting and we have the luck to host uh, Professor Shaul Magid, who's going to give us a conference when did antisemitism become a problem, antisemitism, oppression, and sovereignty. Thank you, Professor Magid, for being here today. Thank you. For those who that doesn't know me, I'm Valentina Gatti. I am the coordinator of the Collective JDT and the Institut de Montréal. Uh, the Collective JDT is the student group that is behind the scene of the interconnection series. And I would like to take just a couple of minutes to, to name and thank who is really behind the scene of the series. And the, the first one, the first person is without any doubt, Alexander Stankovic, who is right in front of me. Since 2021, she's running uh, the lecture series and she's doing an excellent work, answering emails, email, choosing posters, writing to people who are presenting. So it's thank you very much, Alexander, for your work. It's, Thanks to you, we have this space of sharing and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I also would like to thank Jordan Molo, who helped making this closing conference possible today at Concordia University. Our um, lecture series is virtual, but we decided to host the first conference and the last conference, our opening and closing, in, like in a hybrid mode. The first one was at Université de Montréal and with Anthony Le Tourneau in January, and today we're here at Concordia and to honor the bilingual in engagement of our group. And Jordan really did the liaison with Concordia, with the Institute for Canadian Jewish Studies. We have Miranda Kravitz here, who is the director of the Institute, and the Department of Religion and Culture uh, here at Concordia University, and in particular, Naftali Cohn, who is going to reach us in a moment. So both the institute and the department are partner with us today to sponsor this event and the lunch that will follow. Shaul is a pity you cannot be here with us, <laughs> but you are virtually here. So maybe next year you're gonna be in person. Finally, I would like to thank one last time the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies, the very Jewish studies, Jewish Canadian Studies program at, at the University of Ottawa, the Huron University at Webster, and the Micro Program in Jewish Studies at the Université de Montréal and the FICUM for their support. So since the beginning of our lecture series in 2021, they were there to support us and to make this happen. So thank you to everybody. And in particular, thank you to, since we're naming names, to Hernan tesler Mave. Natalia Veselova and Robert Schwarzwald. So without further ado, I leave the floor to Jordan that will introduce our guest, Shaul Magid. Thank you so much, <laughs> Valentina. Before I get into introducing our speaker today, I do just want to give a brief word to those of us who are joining over Zoom. Uh, the schedule of this event will roughly go as follows. I'll introduce our speaker. We'll then go through with the keynote, um, which will be followed by a Q&A of approximately 30 to 40 minutes. Those who would like to ask questions uh, over Zoom are very much welcome to do so, either through the chat box, through the Q&A, or through the Q&A function. And you can also request to unmute yourself if you would prefer to verbalize your question uh, to Professor Magid himself. Um, otherwise, we'll get into introducing our speaker. So Shaul Magid is Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College, Senior Fellow in the Center for the Study of World Religion at Harvard, and Kogod Senior Research Fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. In 2023 and 2024, he will be the visiting professor of modern Jewish studies at Harvard University. Author of many books and essays, his two most recent books are Meir Kahane, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical, published in 2021, and The Necessity of Exile, Essays from a Distance, that will be published in 2023. He is the editor of the column Teiku for Ayin Journal and writes regularly for Plus 972 Magazine and Religious Dispatches. The title of his presentation this afternoon is When Did Antisemitism Become a Problem? Antisemitism, Oppression, and Sovereignty. I'll hand the mic over to you, Professor Magid, and thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan, and thank you, everyone. Jordan, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fast. Okay, great. Well, okay. Thank you. 
Thank you all. Thank you all for being there. And thank you for the invitation. I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to click on to in a couple of pages after uh, after introduction. Um, <clears throat> to begin, when did Jews begin to think of anti-Semitism as a problem? I know it seems like a strange question, since one would think that anti-Semitism is always a problem. But it's is this really the case. The term anti-Semitism was coined in the mid 19th century by Jewish historian and bibliographer Morris Steitzneider and popularized soon after by Wilhelm Marr in the founding of the League of Anti-Semites, Anti-Semitan Liga in 1879. Since then, however, Jewish discussions of anti-Semitism tend to presume it extends back to the more distant past, whether as Jew hatred or anti-Judaism or already anti-Semitism, and that in some sense it was already a problem before the 19th century, and perhaps even as long as there have been Jews. But if we define anti-Semitism as hatred of the Jew qua Jew, ancient antecedents may not quite fit. Do we find in the Hebrew Bible, for example, that Israelites were hated uniquely? Or in late antiquity, are Jews hated more than all others? In the Roman Empire before Constantine, for example, it was Christianity and not Judaism that was the illegal religion and its adherents killed for their beliefs. But by the time we get to the Middle Ages, certainly in Christendom, hatred of the Jews distinctly as Jews seems to solidify, although the nature of that hatred, belief or biology was not yet fleshed out. But even in those cases, it's not clear that Jews saw that as a problem that could be solved. Most Jews seem to have viewed hatred against them as either part of the exilic punishment or as an eternal truth about non-Jews, as suggested by the rabbinic dictum rendering of Esau hates Jacob and its aftermath, which I will mention below. In the fantastical Three Oaths pericope in Talmud Sanhedrin 111a, God says to Israel, and I quote, I promise not to enable the nations to persecute you too much. You'll tear me die. Persecution in general seems to be taken as a covenantal inevitability, maybe even necessity to purify the collective Jewish soul in preparation for the final redemption. By this logic, non-Jewish hatred is simply an inevitable part of Jewish history. What celebrated Jewish historian Salo Baron called its lachrymosity. A different approach emerges among Jews during the modern period of emancipation, as many Jews now wanted to be part of the European societies in which they lived. Anti Semitism emerges in tandem with emancipation as a concept precisely when Jews begin to see the hatred of the Jew qua Jew as a problem that needed to be solved and could be solved. That is something that required social and political and even sometimes theological intervention. It seems that the only way emancipation could be successful is if somehow anti-Semitism was dealt with. And yet the older theological approach of perennial anti-Semitism remained largely within traditional Jewish communities. But emancipation raises another issue for examination. Traditionally and historically, anti-Semitism is coupled with oppression. Jews as a collective were oppressed and anti-Semitism was one way in which that oppression was expressed. Emancipation held the potential for Jews to live outside of a state of oppression, even as we now know they remained in a state of marginalization. But oppression is not to be confused with marginalization or even some, in some cases discrimination. Individuals and even groups can be discriminated against in myriad ways without reaching the bar of oppression, which would result in a substantive curtailing of their ability to flourish in the societies in which they live. Given that distinction, are the Jews an oppressed people today? This question has become equally relevant as Jews navigate a rise in anti-Semitism in the West, plus escalating criticism of Israel, coupled with their success and what might be viewed as a privileged status in North America. By this, I mean that Jews are considered by some as the most successful minority, one of the most successful minority groups in North America, moving 
from largely poor immigrant status to integral citizens with cultural, political, and economic capital. And yet, tropes of perennial Jewish oppression still dominate much of contemporary intra-Jewish discourse, particularly when it comes to discussions of anti-Semitism. I ask the question, why? Oppression has historically been the lens through which Jews see themselves as a collective. The relationship between oppression and the Jews is arguably rooted in the Hebrew Bible. If we understand the birth of the Israelite people through their experience of servitude in Egypt, oppression is the very foundation upon which Jewish identity is founded. As the Passover Haggadah unabashedly states, and I quote, every generation they will rise up to destroy us and God will deliver us from their grasp, end quote. In some sense, oppression is the ultimate positionality of the Jews according to Jewish history. The modern iteration of this existential oppression is often expressed in the term anti-Semitism, which is not about oppression per se, but seems inextricably linked to it. Setting aside the origins of the term anti-Semitism, and whether it accurately describes the nature of the animus that has been directed at the Jews throughout history, the contemporary use of the term is undoubtedly deployed today to describe both hatred and oppression of Jews. The question I ask is, is this a meaning, the question I ask is if this meaning implied by anti-Semitism of both hatred and oppression accurately describes the reality of Jewish life today. And if not, what might then constitute the reality of anti-Semitism in our time? The issue is not whether anti-Semitism still exists. It certainly does. My question is whether the linkage between anti-Semitism and oppression remains operative and what it might mean for our understanding of anti-Semitism if it doesn't. That is, what does anti-Semitism mean if it does not refer to the discrimination of Jews in a context of oppression? And if we determine, as I argue here, that oppression is no longer a category that accurately describes the Jewish experience in most of the West, and certainly not in Israel, then what are the foundations of anti-Semitism today? What are the frames in which it operates? How can we understand and categorize it? In short, what is anti-Semitism if it is no longer accompanied by oppression? And do we need to th rethink its parameters? I ask this question in particular about anti-Semitism in, uh, in North America and, your, and among the European left and among Palestinians living under Israeli military uh, uh, occupation. The question of anti-Semitism on the far right in the US and Europe and Canada is clearly a troubling phenomenon, but is not the focus here for me today. For example, some argue, as we'll see below, that the exclusion of Jews from the political concerns of the left is itself a form of anti-Semitism. Others argue that violence by Palestinian refugees against the state of Israel is a form of anti-Semitism. What do we make of these claims? Can both of these dramatically different scenarios be driven by the same phenomenon? Are we using the right term to describe the phenomenon we are witnessing? I would like to look at the three example the, at three historical examples of Jewish collective life in relation to anti-Semitism and oppression from the last two centuries. This will help us, I think, better understand what we mean when we make claims of anti-Semitism. In the first example, anti-Semitism is both founded on and perpetuates oppression. The classic case is the Nuremberg Laws in Germany in 1935. Though they are, of course, there are, of course, many other cases where anti-Semitism had reached the political realm, whereby Jewish oppression and anti-Semitism becomes a matter of law. Jewish life throughout Europe for hundreds, even thousands of years before emancipation in the 19th century also fits this classic case model. In this state of oppression, which was not, of course, monolithic, Jews were hated or marginalized as Jews. And that hatred both exhibited and perpetuated their oppression. By that, I mean a state of uh, a state whereby Jews cannot be themselves, where they cannot express their Jewishness out of the fear that such expression will hamper their safety and well being, where their collective flourishing is hampered by a systemic animus toward them that is often expressed through political and legislative restrictions. 
In the second case, Jews are not oppressed, yet and yet anti-Semitic acts continue to exist. North America today is the example here. Anti-Semitic acts, even when, even when on the rise, are hardly tolerated in our society. As a, as, and as opposed to being established law, are often illegal and designated as hate crimes, even as they continue to occur. This is not to say that anti-Semitism doesn't spread among the populace in far-right circles, in the dark web, or in some progressive communities, but it is not state-sanctioned. Some call this a stage of normalizing anti-Semitism, but it's harder to make such a case in the broader culture in which we live. The social disapproval and legal consequences for anti-Semitic acts in America today constitute what I am calling the non-oppressed status of North American Jews. This is not to say that Jews do not feel vulnerable to anti-Semitic violence. In many cases, they do, and for good reason. But vulnerability to independent bad actors is not the same as societal or state-sanctioned oppression. The national expression of empathy and mourning for the 11 Jewish victims of the massacre of the Tree Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2008 is an example of both the persistence of anti-Semitism as well as the widespread American sympathy for victims of such heinous acts. The third case represents an unprecedented situation in the history of the Jewish diaspora, that is contemporary Israel. In this case, Jews are certainly not oppressed. To the contrary, they are sovereign rulers of a nation state with substantial military prowess to defend themselves and powerful allies to come to their aid if necessary. At the same time, Israel has been an occupying power ruling over territory and millions of Palestinians for more than half a century. In this situation, even if one justifies the occupation, it's not a stretch to category Israeli Jews as the oppressors in this dynamic. The military rule of occupation clearly curtails the freedom and flourishing of the people living under the occupation, certainly physically and economically, but arguably existentially as well. Under these conditions, attacks on Israelis by the occupied population as acts of resistance against occupation persist. Can these acts be categorized as anti-Semitic? That is, should a violent act that targets Israeli Jews by someone who is oppressed by the Israeli state be deemed anti-Semitic, even if that same act of violence could be seen as terrorism? An important distinction to keep in mind here is that I'm not assessing whether the actor in any of these cases is or isn't an anti-Semite. Rather, I'm interested in asking a different question. Do they hate the Jews because they are Jews, the classic definition of anti-Semitism, or do they hate Jews because Jews are the people oppressing them? In this case, I'm only assessing the act itself. I am asking, can rebellion against oppression be considered anti-Semitism? So I want to share the screen now if I could. Okay. To shed light on these questions, I first turned to Hannah Arendt's essay, Reflections on Little Rock, that was published in Descent magazine in 1959, which is not about anti-Semitism, but anti-Black racism. Arendt describes three distinct categories of racism that are also relevant for our discussion of anti-Semitism, the private, the social, and the political. Her essay was critical of Eisenhower's decision to forcibly integrate schools in Little Rock, Arkansas using the National Guard. And she claimed that what made of, motivated her critique was the now infamous photo of a little black girl being led into school as she was heckled, spit on, and demeaned by a menacing white crowd. For Arendt, private racism is limited to personal opinions. We can extrapolate here to say that private anti-Semitism constitute those who hold negative views of Jews, or what sociologist and Jewish community leader Earl Rabb called in the 1970s folk anti-Semitism. But keep those views limited to private settings. Folk anti-Semites, Rabb argues, may hold negative views of Jews, but they would never agree to formally limit Jewish life through legislation. Arendt's second category 
is racism expressed as social exclusion. We can call this social anti-Semitism, in which a group of people hold negative views of Jews and so exclude them from their social world, for example, from a country club or a summer camp or an informal social network. While more troubling than folk anti-Semitism, this exclusion does not extend into political or legal arenas. Jews may not be able to belong to this country club, but they can have a country club of their own. Lastly, Arendt's third category is the political. In the case of anti-Semitism, this category is clearly described in the classic case mentioned above, that is the Nuremberg Laws, in which a society politically legislates the exclusion of Jews in rights and privileges granted to other citizens. Arendt's categories are a helpful tool, I think, in thinking through the three historical cases I offered above. We can see how these three categories, when applied to anti-Semitism, manifest and interact differently in each of the cases. The sharp distinctions between the categories are most relevant in our second case in North, North America, where Jews are not politically oppressed and yet are still subject to private and sometimes even social anti-Semitism. These distinctions become blurrier in the case where Jews are clearly oppressed and where the private sphere often bleeds into the social and political arenas. In the third case, Israel, where Jews are politically sovereign and thus control the public and political sphere, political anti-Semitism does not really exist as the Jews are dominant political actors. A subtext to this discussion of oppression and anti-Semitism is power. Oppression is not simply a state of hatred. It is an exercise in power. This is captured succinctly in a quote by the black novelist and essayist James Baldwin cited in James Cone's The Cross and the Lynching Tree about racism, where Baldwin writes, racial prejudice is endemic to human life. Everybody hates everybody. It's really about power. I don't care whether Senator Eastland of Mississippi or Barry Goldwater likes me. This was written in the 1960s. I do care that they have the power to keep me out of a home, a job. I don't care what they think or what they feel. I care about their power. In short, oppression is hatred coupled with power. Thus, anti-Semitism can exist without oppression. That is, if a society prevents anti-Semitism from being implemented by means of a power structure, or in Arendt's terms, if society prevents anti-Semitism from moving from the social to the political realm. In other words, hatred of Jews in the private sphere without anti-Semitism in the pu public political sphere is not oppression, according to this definition, although it still may be a form of anti-Semitism. But is it right to use the same term that is used when acts against Jews exhibit forms of oppression, given the phenomenon that we are speaking about uh, is quite different? If we say then that today Jews are not oppressed in North America, how do we understand anti-Semitic acts against them? And what might be an answer to that question? Tell what might be a, and, and what might an answer to that question tell us about anti-Semitism today? So I want to address this using three contemporary thinkers, each of whom weighs in on the question of anti-Semitism and oppression in different but related ways. The first is an essay by Aviva by Aviva Cantor Zukov called The Oppression of American Jews that was published in 1970. The second by a book by British comedian and activist David Badiel entitled Jews Don't Count. And the third, a book by Israeli philosopher Elad Lapidot called Jews Out of the Question, both published in 2022. Aviva Zukov Cantor was one of the leaders of the radical Jewish movement in the 1960s and 1970s, an important figure who never received the attention she deserved. She was, among other things, the editor of the Jewish Liberation Journal. And in 1970, she published an essay entitled The Oppression of America's Jews. In it, she argued that Jews in America, and here she limits herself to the US, at that time were not oppressed in any conventional or discernible way, but they were oppressed, she argues, in ways that prevented them from fully integrating into American society. This is in part because Jews had to fit into a certain paradigm in the American social, culture, and political system in order to succeed. Their whiteness, at least in the American context, 
excluded them from the color line that W.E.B. Du Bois argued is the core of American society, but their Jewishness still marginalized them from Christian America. This, she argued, curtailed the free, their freedom as Jews. In her essay, Zukov suggested a kind of oppression based on American genteel anti-Semitism that did not threaten the Jews politically, but limited them in more subtle personal ways. Her analysis provides us with a perspective that sheds light on the question of Jews and oppression after the advent of multiculturalism in the 1980s. I'll get to that in a moment. That is, if Zukov is right about the subtle psychic and cultural oppression endemic to assimilation in the 1970s, America in terms of the uh, 1970s America in terms of the need to shed one's overt Jewish identity in order to succeed or advance in that society. Multiculturalism and the ensuing celebration of diversity that followed in the 1980s and 1990s may have erased even that subtle form of oppression for Jews in America. Even still, her analysis is useful for probing the spectrum of Jewish experience in relation to various forms of oppression. So Zukov's analysis is based on two foundations, race and class. Jewish success is often measured by these two metrics. Because Jews have become white, and because by 1970 Jews had largely moved solidly into the middle and even upper middle classes, Jews were deemed a successful ethnic minority in both whiteness and prosperity, and this is tr even more true today. In that race and class are the primary metrics of oppression in the US for Zukov and others. American Jews do not fall into the category of the oppressed. And yet, Zukov claimed that in 1970 at least, American Jews were still oppressed in a more subterranean register. While she doesn't focus on anti-Semitism per se, it seems to me that persistent anti-Semitism is the underlying factor in her analysis. That is, Zukov may have been making a distinction between past forms of anti-Semitism, which Jewish lives were overtly threatened or where their freedom was explicitly curtailed to a time in America where those threats no longer applied, but in which a subtler form of oppression expressed itself in a psychically and socially palpable form of anti-Semitism which is why, as we will see, she did not see a future for Jews in America. And she writes as follows. Are Jews in America oppressed? To begin to answer this question, we must first define oppression. As the term is used here, oppression in its various forms means the denial of the most basic human right to be yourself. It means being forced into a situation where your destiny is not in your own hands, but in the hands of others, usually of your enemy. It means to be exploited and used in the interests of the oppressor, of the oppression. It is being forced to adopt to the conditions in such a way as to prevent retaliation on the part of the oppressor. Thus, when we come to consider whether Jews in America are oppressed, we should not be sidetracked by the fact that they happen to be, by and large, economically well off and not subject to the kind of physical oppression faced by Blacks, Indians, and Chicanos in America. And she also adds elsewhere women. It is necessary to look at what is going on beneath the surface. So Zukov is attempting to examine whether Jews' economic success and relative smooth integration into American society belies limitations to Jewish flourishing that were indeed structurally founded and subtly enforced. She argued that Jews remain habituated to keeping a low profile in Christian countries and continue to do so in the U.S. so as to not evoke the ire of white Christian America, who accept them but want to keep them in a subtly subservient position. Whether, itself, whether this itself can be viewed as a form of anti-Semitism is an open question. However, Zukov did suggest it was a form of oppression. So her basic assumption is that, a Jew, that Jewish American diaspora is not a break from the Jewish past, but a unique iteration of it. Jewish responses to oppression in the past therefore remain functional in the American present. The operative American paradigm is assimilation what she calls the carrot held out in front of the Jew's nose. And as long as Jews buy into the idea of assimilation, they are able to move up the social and economic ladder, even as this very dynamic supports the erasure 
of the Jew qua Jew. In such a state, she suggests, the Jewish assimilationist feels a great deal of rage against the oppressors whom he does not define as such. Unable to turn his rage on them, he turns it on himself or on his fellow, his or her fellow Jews. If he could only eradicate the vestiges of his Jewishness made conspicuous by the all too visible existence of the Jewish group, assimilation is in essence the conditioning and programming of the Jews into ethnic amnesia. Assimilation does occupy the center of Zukov's analysis of Jewish oppression, even if she doesn't focus on the phenomenon. In her estimation, the error of American Jews is that they buy into American liberalism with the hope and expectation that it will eradicate anti-Semitism. That because liberalism is constitutively protect, constitutionally protected, it will be the solution to the Jewish question. Jews prosper in the US, but they do so, she implies, at least in 1970, largely under the same structural conditions of white Christian dominance as they did when they were politically oppressed. The only difference is that political oppression has been replaced with an oppression of tolerance under conditions by which the Jewishness of the Jew diminishes. For Zukov, the prosperity to avoid, uh, the propensity to avoid assertiveness or to wallow in self-critique is a form of oppression. The oppressor needn't critique the Jew since the Jew critiques herself. And I'm quoting her. While black militants do not hesitate to speak of their 300 year oppression, Jews shrink from mentioning our 20 centuries of persecution, end quote. Zukov notes that Jewish history had been ignored in American textbooks and the media, while the history of other minorities is celebrated. Oppression is always destructive and dehumanizing for the oppressed, but oppression that is experienced as oppression at least frees the oppressed from his self-hatred and alienation. Oppression is not experienced as oppression, I'm sorry, oppression that is not experienced as oppression is however far more destructive to a human being. He internalizes the oppressor's hostility and mythology and turns it on himself and more accurately in the case of Jews, the Jewish parts of himself. Her conclusion is that the United States oppresses the Jews by making their power and success conditioned on the shedding or at least minimizing of their overt Jewishness in order for them to receive nominal shares in the American dream. Think of all the name changing among Jewish actors in the 1940s and 1950s. In short, American Jewish experience is one of internalized anti-Semitism in Zukov's analysis. The condition for this oppression of toleration, of course, is galut or exile. The very notion of galut in the Jewish imagination is that the exiled are by definition oppressed as a people. For Zukov, exile and oppression are mutually dependent categories. He or she may be on solid rabbinic ground in agreement even with the rabbinic teachings that argue for the necessity or the, of exile. At the end of her essay, we see that her only solution to the unique oppression of American Jews is Aliyah, immigration to Israel, since the only majority status can resolve such oppression. Interestingly, she never immigrates to Israel. As a radical feminist and leftist, she doesn't address the solution for women and black Americans who have no homeland to return to, but for Jews, she suggests, there is a solution to their oppression exiting their minority status, especially when that minority status is disguised as a non-issue in their pursuit of freedom and acceptance. In short, immigration, uh, aliyah or immigration to a majority Jewish culture. Now, one of the dangers of Jewish oppression in America, according to Zukov, is that it doesn't really force the Jews to leave. That is because this subtle form of oppression still allows Jews to live freely Anti-Semitism, while it still exists, does not pose a systemic problem that would initiate a collective movement to emigrate. Half a century later, much has changed. America, uh, America uh, uh, um, acts, uh, uh, anti-Semitic acts in America have continued and even increased recently, but laws prohibiting them have also increased. 
America has numerous major political figures who are Jewish and the nation's first second gentleman Doug Emhoff is Jewish and the multicultural trends in public discourse and education over the last three decades have which foregrounded an appreciation for diversity have enabled and even promoted Jewish expression. So my question is, does Zukov's analysis still resonate in a multicultural or even post-multicultural society that did not exist when her essay was written in 1970? For our limited purposes, it's worth asking whether Zukov's essay is simply outdated, at least regarding Jews in North America. Multiculturalism has arguably provided a societal template whereby assimilation is no longer demanded of minorities. The hair straightening, nose jobbing, name changing Jew of the past is not the Jew of today. In a society where difference is celebrated, does Zukov's vision of Jewish oppression simply disintegrate? Could we say that Jewish distinctiveness is not anathema today, but to the contrary, part of the cultural landscape? That Jews can exercise their difference and do so in a way that such difference is not only tolerated, but protected. In other words, does American multiculturalism truly protect and even celebrate minority distinctiveness? In Zukov's vision of the Jewish oppression no longer, if Zukov's vision of the Jewish oppression no longer makes sense today, as appears to me that it doesn't, what do we make of the fact that anti-Semitism remains a source of real tension? That is, what is anti-Semitism without Jewish oppression? North American Jewry has proven resilient and successful. Multiculturalism has enabled Jewish identity to flourish for those who choose to pursue it. Intermarriage rates that have risen precipitously but have not destroyed Jewish communal life. And while anti-Semitism persists, it has not produced widespread social intolerance against Jews. From here, I conclude that even given the continued occurrence of anti-Semitic acts, Jews in America today are not systematically oppressed people, and thus they constitute a distinctive, albeit perhaps not completely unique, iteration in the history of anti-Semitism. So in order to better understand how all this relates to our more contemporary situation, I turn now to David Badiel's uh, short book, Jews Don't Count, published in 2022. Badiel's central claim is that the left today, he lives in Great Britain, that the left today largely downgrades anti-Semitism to a second tier form of racism, or not racism at all because Jews are not a race. The result is that because Jews are not a race, that is, they've been absorbed into whiteness. Um, let me start that sentence again. The result is that because Jews are not a race, that they've been absorbed into whiteness and thus not subject to racial discrimination, the left deems them unworthy of their support or concern. Badio writes as follows, and I quote, so the assumption appears to be that because the Jews are not immediately visible, they don't suffer racism. Jews don't really suffer from being considered different because they don't look different. Those are Badio's words. Badil's thesis is that anti-Semitism on the left is manifested not by violent acts against Jews, but rather by the exclusion of Jews from the status of an oppressed people, in part because they are not subject to racial discrimination. This very act of exclusion is for Badil anti-Semitism. My question is, considering that Jews are not politically oppressed in the West today, why is Badil so focused on saying that they are? And what does it mean that he so strongly associates anti-Semitism with the denial of the status of an oppressed people? Why and how are the two things connected for him? And what can this association tell us about the relationship between anti-Semitism and oppression? Above, I suggested that historically oppression was a condition of anti-Semitism, but it's not so in contemporary North America. Badil argues that regarding anti-Semitism on the left, it is precisely that because Jews are not considered oppressed, because they are considered white, they are excluded from the concerns of the left, and this very exclusion constitutes anti-Semitism. From multiple angles, Badil's argument easily collapses in on itself. But why is he making the argument to begin with? 
As we've established in North America, Jews are not politically oppressed. And the same is true in the UK, where Badiel is writing. It is worth citing a 2000 report by Britain's leading race relations think tank, Runny Me Trust, which states as follows. Jews see themselves historically as an oppressed group. However, Jews in Britain today face relatively little discrimination. The number of anti-Semitic incidents is small, the impact of anti-Semitic propaganda is marginal, and anti-Semitism has ceased to be socially acceptable. That's from 2000. While the number of anti-Semitic instances in Britain has increased, it's reached its height in 2021, and anti-Zionism of people like Jeremy Corbyn may indeed be anti-Semitic, I think this assessment generally still holds, at least regarding overt discrimination. This directly opposes Badil's assessment, which serves as the very thesis of his book. For Badil, although it is precisely the apparent lack of, uh, of attention, that is for him the very roots of British anti-Semitism. Some of what Badil suggests is the intentional exclusion of Jews from the leftist agenda that might be rooted in covert anti-Semitism maybe what Arendt called the social prejudice. But in many more cases, I suspect, it's related to one of two issues, or maybe both. First, it may be a response to an admittedly unnuanced assessment of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or at least a highly charged partisan view of Israel's discriminatory policies when it comes to Palestinians. Israel is often viewed by the left, rightly or wrongly, as an oppressor, and that assessment situates Israel and its supporters outside the purview of the left's concern. If this is the reason, conscious or unconscious, and I'm not making a value judgment of right or wrong, but if this is the reason for the exclusion of Jews from progressive concerns, there's clearly some fuzzy logic involved in that Israelis and Jews, which are really discrete groups of people, are conflated. Second, the exclusion may have to do with the fact that Jews are viewed as a highly successful and, and integrated ethnic minority in the West that enjoys racial and class privilege. In other words, as the opposite of an oppressed group. One may disagree with either of these assessments, but they don't necessarily constitute anti-Semitism in and of themselves. So it seems to me that Badial is mixing up a few categories. First, the stereotype of Jewish power, certainly a common anti-Semitic trope. And second, the question as to whether or not Jews are oppressed, which is in and of itself holds no inherent value judgment. In his conclusion, or certainly there a lack of clear distinctions, he argues that the notion that Jews are either oppressed, I'm sorry, that the Jews are neither oppressed nor a race is somehow a reflection of their perception as humanity's masters and thus an, exa, an exercise in anti-Semitism. He then jumps to the conclusion that claiming Jews, Jews experience any kind of privilege is also anti-Semitic, presumably for the same reasons, although Badil never tells us what they actually are. So I think that his lack of clear thinking, his argument raises an interesting question about how anti-Semitism is often perceived. If Jews are oppressed, then the claim of anti-Semitism makes sense, since anti-Semitism has almost always historically been linked to oppression. That is, anti-Semitism is one common expression of oppression. But if the Jews are now not oppressed, if their collective station in life is not being threatened, if their political aspirations are being fulfilled in the form of a nation state, and if their ability to practice religion is largely assured, why should the left include them? in their sphere of political concern for the oppressed. In this case, it seems hardly surprising that Jews are left out, as Badil states. But whether this exclusion itself constitutes a form of anti-Semitism is another matter. Badil seems to want Jews to be included in the category of oppressed peoples, while also acknowledging that they're not oppressed as much as some other groups are in Britain. As a consequence of this failure of imagination for him, um, the claim of non-oppression, even true, may of non-oppression, um, even if true, may itself be anti-Semitic. So I want to turn now to a much more sophisticated approach to this question on the erasure of Jews and a concern on the left in Elad Lapidot's book, Jews Out of the Question. 
both both published, as I said, in 2022. Lapidot, um, an Israeli who teaches in France, makes a complex case of what of, against what he calls anti anti Semitism, one that delves into dense philosophical analysis. And I'm going to only gesture at it here. But suffice to say, Lapidot claims that anti Semitism and anti anti Semitism share something in common that what is at issue in both cases is not animus toward the Jews. That is, I'm sorry, not animus toward the Jews. And that in a sense, neither is about actual Jews, but rather the real issue for Lapidot is talking about Jews at all. So Lapidot suggests that according to the logic of anti-anti-Semitism, the only sure way to fight anti-Semitism is simply not to talk about Jews at all. He introduces the concept of anti-anti-Semitism, which is how to counter anti-Semitism in the following way, and you'll see on, on the screen. If, however, a basic observation of this book is that anti-anti-Semitism fundamentally rejects anti-Semitic knowledge of the Jews, categorically rejects, in fact, any knowledge of the Jewish as mere perception, construction, projection, imagination, fantasy, and myth, as already noted, this book will indicate how anti-antisemitism most fundamentally tends to criticize antisemitism, not for thinking against Jews, but for thinking of Jews at all, namely for engaging Jews as an object of thought, as an epistemic entity. In other words, so the claim anti-antisemitism has criticized anti-semitism for introducing the Jews or the Jewish as an entity of thought. To formulate it provocatively, uh, uh, Lapidot says, the analysis will show that anti-antisemitism is really anti-Jewish. To unpack this claim, Lapidot suggests that opposition to anti-semitism, what he calls anti-antisemitism, is not simply arguing um, against a negative appraisal of the Jew, but is more generally against the notion that Jews are an object of knowledge at all, what Lapidot calls an episteme. For Lapidot to imply, as he claims anti-antisemitism does, that Jews cannot be an object of knowledge is essentially an epistemic claim, a claim that what can and cannot be known, talked about, examined, or excavated. Thus, he also asserts that such oppression, that is, to remove Jews from being an object of knowledge, is in fact anti-Jewish, in that it objects to the existence of Jewishness in the realm of general knowledge. Part of this claim is that if we allow Jews to become an object of knowledge, as he clearly believes we must, we cannot then dictate whether they are thought of positively or negatively. So if we don't want Jews to be viewed negatively, we can't talk about them at all, because any object must be able to be evaluated both positively and negatively. But if any negative assessment of the Jew is anti-Semitic, then one can't talk about the Jews. Thus, for Lapidot, according to the logic of anti-antisemitism, the only way out of anti-Semitism is not to say anything about the Jews. This is because once you say something about the Jews qua Jews, they become an object of thought. And once they become an object of thought, they become susceptible to a negative appraisal. Lapido contends that according to the anti-antisemite, for there to be no anti-Semitism, the Jew qua Jew simply must, must not be viewed as an object of knowledge. It would be for this reason illegitimate or rather invalid in principle and epistemically fallacious to criticize, antagonize, or oppose this human collective, to be anti-Jewish, not because Jews are essentially good, or not because Jews, uh, not because Jews are essentially good, not because the anti is wrong, but because the Jewish stands for, manifests, or figures no specific content, no specific data. Strictly speaking for Lapidot, there is no Jew. As explored above, Badil's perspective is exactly the opposite. He contends that taking Jews out of the question by excluding them from progressive causes is not a victory over anti-Semitism, but is itself a form of anti-Semitism. Therefore, Badil's version of anti-Semitism, taking Jews out of the question, to borrow 
Lapidot's phrase, is for Lapidot the only way not to fall into anti-Semitism? Of course, Lapidot argues this somewhat cynically and perhaps, perhaps polemically, because not talking about the Jew would make them anomalous and thus even more subject to age-old claims of anti-Semitism. But what about a case where you can't leave the Jew out? A case where the Jew is the one who wields power over others. What is anti-Semitism when Jews are the dominant political actors, for example, in the state of Israel? The final case in my exploration of what constitutes anti-Semitism and how it relates to oppression is a particularly sensitive one. How do we assess acts against Jews by people who live under Jewish power? In other words, what constitutes anti-Semitism when Jews are in fact the oppressors? For example, is a Palestinian who throws a rock at an Israeli car in protest against the Israeli military occupation engaged in an act of anti-Semitism? While it is certainly a violent act and even an act of terrorism, is it an anti-Semitic act? Regardless of one's view of the occupation, if we can agree that the Palestinian is oppressed, that their individual and collective existence is limited by Jewish hegemony, and if Israel is the source of that oppression, can we define the act of resisting such oppression as anti-Semitic? Especially in light of the complicated ways that oppression and anti-Semitism implicate each other, as we've seen above. So I ask this provocatively uh, um, to destabilize and interrogate our understanding of anti <laughs> the Israeli <laughs> occupation is not simply one where the Jew is not oppressed, as in the case of the U.S., but rather where the Jew is actually the one in power. This conundrum is made explicit by Anthony Lehrman in his book, Whatever Happened to Antisemitism, that's worth citing one quote here. There is precious little sympathy in Jewish-Israeli society with the plight of the Palestinians. Zionism saw Palestinians as ambi ambiguous figures, at best capable of being civilized by bringing modernity to Palestine, a classical, uh, which is a kind of classical colonialist view. At worst, backward. If at first Palestinians, uh, if at first Palestinians' resistance was as fundamentally political, anti-Palestinian discrim discrimination was justified on the grounds of security, controlling the enemy within, so on and so on. But as Palestinians increasingly develop their own ability to tell their own national story, both through a historical and cultural narrative and armed resistance, and therefore demonstrated that they would not accept their dispossession, Jewish Israelis came to explain Palestinian stubbornness by, uh, by branding it as a form of anti-Semitism. With the development of this new anti-Semitism theory, it is easy to slot Palestinian hatred of Jews into the eternalist understanding of anti-Semitism. Their total opposition to Zionism in a Jewish state was simply a form of delegitimization and demonization. This new anti-Semitism, as it was coined some years ago, referred to by Lehman, basically views anti-Zionism as a new form of anti-Semitism, <clears throat> In, in which Israel is, as Canadian intellectual and political uh, politician Erwin Cutler put it, the new collective Jew, Israel as the new collective Jew. Whether this is valid or not is not relative for our purposes. The relevant question is if this equation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism also applies to Palestinians. Can victims of Zionism be called anti-Semitic because they oppose Zionism? This may seem like a strange question, given the complex way the, uh, the occupation is framed in the discourse of Israel-Palestine, but it is sadly relevant, it's sadly relevant today. For example, in a New York Times essay on August 26, 2022, entitled, Has the Fight Against Anti-Semitism Lost Its Way? Peter Beinart observed the paradox of the Palestinian struggle for civil rights in Israel. And he writes as follows. In 2018, several Palestinian members of the Knesset tried to introduce legislation that would grant Palestinians equal citizenship rather than what Israel Human Rights Group uh, B'Tselem calls Jewish supremacy. According to the Americans most prominent Jewish organizations and the US government, this kind of call for equal citizenship constituted bigotry. 
Calls for equality in the Israeli democratic society are considered as acts of bigotry, if not an expression of anti-Semitism. This is part of the problem of assessing anti-Semitism in a case where Jews are in power. If fighting oppression against Jewish hegemony is anti-Semitic, what recourse does the Palestinian population have to legitimately express their collective rights? And if they are denied those collective rights by Zionism, how is Zionism different than those regimes who denied the collective rights of Jews in the past, the very impetus for Zionism in the first place? So one way to begin briefly to, uh, to examine this case is by assessing how Jewish violence against non-Jews, Jewish violence against non-Jews, real and imagined is understood. So in his book, The Peace and Violence of Judaism from the Bible to Modern Zionism, George Washington University professor Rob Eisen examines Jewish violence towards non-Jews throughout history, both violence embedded in Judaism as Jews, as violent actors separate from the tradition. In his long chapter on modern Zionism, Eisen revisits the role violence has played in Zionism, both secular and religious, acknowledging that violent tendencies towards the Arabs in the land of Israel in both Zionist thought and practice cannot simply be viewed as solely reactive. That is the result of Arab violence against Jews. Eisen rehearses a very common trope that Jews' violent tendencies are the product of centuries of violence against them by non-Jews. Put another way, the defensive argument that even if Zionist violence was not reactive against Arab violence, it is the product of centuries of persecution that forge deep resentment and violent hostility to non-Jews that were viewed as threatening. While there's much one could discuss about this assessment, it is certainly very plausible to suggest that the Jewish experience of violence against them had an impact on the violence now deployed by them. And this, of course, would not be true only of the Jews. We can use the same logic to explain black violence against white Americans or of any colonized population against their former colonizers. Were black slave revolts in the 19th century an example of black racism against white slavers? For the sake of argument, let us say Eisen is correct, and the historic victimization of Jews should evoke sympathy for, or at least an understanding of, violent tendencies that Zionists display toward the Palestinian Arabs. Shouldn't the same logic then be applied to the violence of Palestinians against uh, as active resistors? Can we also say their act of violence is not against Jews per se or only, but against Jews as their oppressor or in their view, colonizers? Just as Eisen is not exonerating Zionist violence against Arabs, but only trying to understand it, why can't the same explanation be used for Palestinians who have lived under Jewish occupation for more than two generations in conditions that are certainly commensurate with some cases of Jewish persecution? Not all cases, but some cases. Is there a justifiable explanation? If there is a justifiable explanation, this is an important point from my perspective. If there is a justifiable explanation, then it cannot be called anti-Semitic. This is because while in most cases anti-Semitism implies at least some oppression of Jews, and while we can acknowledge that anti-Semitism can occur outside of the oppression of the Jews, such as in the West today, it seems indefensible to claim that anti-Semitism can occur when the Jew is the oppressor and the alleged anti-Semite is fighting that oppression. Whether we deem such a violent reaction to opposition legitimate or not, I do not think anti-Semitism is the proper term to describe it. Anti-Semitism is the hatred of Jews qua Jews. It has no justification, nor should evoke any sympathy. In a context in which violence can be understood as motivated by, uh, by other often ob quite obvious reasons, anti-Semitism should not be used as an explanation and certainly not as a weapon to invalidate a legitimate contestation against oppression. In short, if it can be understood in Eisen's terms regarding Zionist violence, it should not be called anti-Semitism. In the final paragraph, scholars such as Hannah Arendt and New York University professor David Engel have warned us against recklessly expanding the term anti-Semitism in part because it too easily becomes weaponized as a tool to delegitimize or undermine legitimate critique of individual Jews or of Israel. 
I'm not arguing that animus against Jews is only limited to cases where they are oppressed. As I showed, anti-Semitic acts continue in North America where Jews are not oppressed. And in Israel, attacks against Jews exist even as Jews are the ones in power. However, there is a danger in my view in viewing such acts in wildly different contexts under the single umbrella of anti-Semitism. Fighting anti-Semitism or violent acts against Jews is important, it's crucial, but it is also as important to analyze and examine how and why these acts are committed and in what context and how they are best defined under the rubrics of bigotry, racism, prejudice, and hatred of the other. Thank you very much. Please join me in another round of applause for this speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again to Professor Magid for delivering this incredible and uh, highly generative lecture. Thank you to Valentina and to Alex for helping me organize this and co-organizing it. It's been wonderful. And again, to our sponsors, the Institute for Canadian Jewish Studies, the Department of Religions and Cultures, the ones that Valentina mentioned <laughs> earlier today, <laughs> earlier, but I can't remember. And then to everyone else, of course, for joining with us this afternoon. Um, there is a light lunch being served for those who joined in person. It's all we could afford. Thank you <laughs> anyway. Um, so it'll be downstairs. Um, with that, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us over Zoom as well. Um, Stay tuned, I guess, next year for the 2024 Interconnections Lecture Series. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you all again so much. That's all for now. Thank Bye. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care.